My name is Dr. Andreas Rechkemmer. I am a professor of global and public policy and international relations at Hamad bin Khalifa University uh, College of Public Policy here in Doha, Qatar. And it is my um, pleasure and honor to welcome all of you to the session. Definitely welcome our distinguished panelists that I'm going to introduce in a, in a few moments. Uh, briefly on the session, global challenges and crises are likely to be the norm rather than the exception in this 21st century. The COVID-19 pandemic continues amidst uh, still insufficient vaccine distribution and um, coverage and also emerging new variants and sub-variants suggesting that the largest global health crisis in at least a century is here to stay for some time. Secondly, the uh, rapidly deteriorating humanitarian crisis in Afghanistan and recently Russia's invasion and war in Ukraine remind us of the inherent uh, fragility of the international order and uh, its institutions as we witness a fundamental shift in the global and regional geopolitical balance of power. And at the same time, the goals of the Paris Agreement appear to be slipping out of reach toward ending unimaginable threats like mega heat waves, floods, droughts, hurricanes, famines, mass migration, and conflicts throughout the century. So we want to explore what innovative and wherever needed disruptive legal, economic, and political tools are required to tackle the climate crisis? What can governments, international organizations, and civil society do to spur the technological advances, investments, economic paradigm shifts, social movements, and large-scale behavior change needed for climate resilience? And how can climate justice become a reality supported by the powerful and wealthy? And I would like to uh, introduce to you our speakers, um, starting with uh, His Excellency uh, Mr. Achim Steiner, who is the administrator of the uh, United Nations Development Program, UNDP, and Under Secretary General. His Excellency Mr. Mahdi Mohamed Gulaid, who is the Deputy Prime Minister of the Federal Republic of Somalia. Uh, Dr. Deborah Brosnan, who is president of Brosnan and Associates uh, in Washington, D.C., and also adjunct professor of Virginia Tech. Her Excellency, the Honorable Jenny Salesa, member of uh, Parliament uh, in New Zealand and chair of the Foreign Affairs, Trade and Defense Committee. And His Excellency, Ambassador Munir Akram uh, from Pakistan, who is uh, the permanent representative of Pakistan through the United Nations in New York and also chair of the Group of 77 in China. A very, very a powerful and distinguished panel, and thank you all for joining us, and thank you for being here. I'm going to ask uh, a first round of questions to the panelists, then a second round, and then we'll engage in a discussion involving our dear uh, audience. My first uh, question goes to Achim Steiner. How can the UN system as a whole be utilized creatively to catalyze and support a better, more effective governance approach to the climate crisis? Thank you, Andreas, for the question. I'm a great honor to, to join such a distinguished panel. And let me answer with a slightly provocative answer that uh, the implication in your question is that it has not provided an effective governance mechanism so far. And so I think um, as a good loyal UN uh, staff member, let me in a sense challenge that notion from the point of view that had we not had an intergovernmental panel on climate change that allowed the world scientists to come together and speak freely as to what science was telling us, 30 years, that this has been happening. Had we not had a convention, the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change, that essentially brings every country around the table once a year, do you believe we would have reached anything 
even close to a Paris Agreement, a Kyoto Protocol, or the ability to look to the future in terms of addressing climate change with the kinds of commitments that we now have? I would argue no, and yet we all, and I'm the first one to acknowledge this, find it painfully slow. And in that sense, I accept your challenge. What is it that the United Nations can do next? And I think part of that lies in having tried to understand how climate change will, first of all, affect the world at large. Then increasingly through science, being able to interpret the impacts of climate change on individual regions, countries, sometimes even specific areas, let's say coastal zones, arid lands, tropical forests, Science now tells us that at um, three to four degrees, the Amazon ecosystem will cease to function. Um, that should make every South American be extremely worried because this is the single most important water pump and therefore hydrological backbone of the entire South American hydrological economy. Um, if we look to sea level rise, if we look to how many hundreds of millions of people across the world, in fact billions, live along coastal zones, we are be able to, to pinpoint the effects. But what is it that ultimately will make countries not only come to the climate change negotiations, commit in principle to taking steps? I think it will be two things. One, first of all, we need to take the commitments about acting on climate change back into the national reality. The national economy, the national political economy, national planning, national budgeting systems, national infrastructure strategies, national energy strategies, because it is there that sovereign nations essentially transact how they wish to move forward in the face of such a challenge. And I think it is crucial that we do realize that at the end of the day, we live in a world of sovereign nations and decision making is a function of what happens within a body politic, elections, public opinion polls, etc. And I think the United Nations and UNDP, in fact, plays a very active role there because what we are trying to do with our climate promise is at the moment to assist 120 countries to take their national climate strategies they brought to Glasgow and translate them into the national planning and investment and budgeting processes that allow these commitments, these more ambitious commitments, to become part of the national fabric. But the second critical part is that the United Nations and the Secretary General continuously speaks to the international community on that, recognizes that it must co-invest in these efforts. We do live in a world where different legacies, different capacities to act, different responsibilities do not simply make everybody equal. It is fundamental that we recognize, first of all, the both essential nature of the wealthier part of the world, also very often the part of the world that has the greater accumulated emissions, to lead in investments, first of all, in their own economies, and secondly, to co-invest in an accelerated um, transition in many developing and emerging economies. And I use the term co-invest because I think the world also needs to recognize that it is not paying for other countries to essentially become you know, less carbon intensive or ultimately get to net zero it is co-investing because these countries already are mobilizing hundreds of billions of dollars today, investing in climate change adaptation mitigation. And so the great pact of the 21st century will be whether we come together in co-investing and secondly, we can land climate change agendas in national development plans. And I think in both of these respects, the United Nations um, is playing a very significant role and hopefully through the work that we can do in UNDP, also the role of being not somebody who lectures countries on what to do, but allows them to connect global best practice, global financial resources, technology access. These are the variables of accelerating action on climate change. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you so much for your, uh, for your answer. Thank you. My next question goes um, to uh, Mr. Benaid. Somalia has witnessed uh, a massive drought and ongoing uh, desertification, um, what additional or alternative action should be taken to tackle climate change in your country and in Africa more broadly? Thank you very much for uh, having me. I would like to first of all thank uh, the Amir of Qatar for inviting me and my delegation to this important forum of uh, gathering of Doha Forum. Uh, coming back to your question, 
Yes, uh, climate change is a crisis nowadays all over the world, and uh, there is interrelation between climate change and drought. Uh, we used to, as rural people and, and in Africa, especially in the Horn of Africa, uh, we used to experience drought maybe one is in every 10 years, 20 years, or, or one is in every 50 years. But in the intervention of the climate change and global warming, uh, what we experience is uh, recurrent drought, whereby drought hits uh, every year annually and causes displacement, uh, causes refugees, people taking refuge from their home to, to another places, uh, migration and, and other uh, drought inflicted problems. So what we experience, and that is in the Horn of Africa entirely, not only Somalia, is uh, yes, when there is a rainy season, uh, there are floods. And floods, you know, uh, when they break out, it is because of the climate change. And as my, as my colleague said, scientists have reported and I uh, need to study further uh, that climate change causes flood many times and also drought. So we are in between drought and flood. And every time there is a drought, there are people who are migrating from their uh, original homeland, displacement, uh, and when there is flood again. So we need to stand together and, and, and respond to the catastrophic climate change. So these forced migrations and displacement are directly attributable to climate-related shocks, which exacerbates intercommunal tensions of the dwindling natural resources. Uh, and coming back to Somalia, the current drought was preceded by another one. If every year there is drought going on. Uh, not only drought, also there are locust infestation. Uh, my father used to work for uh, an organization which uh, was responsible for locust control. And it is established in the 50s or 40s by the British uh, administration in the, in the entire Horn of Africa. Uh, and what I, growing up in Hargeisa, Somalia, what I used to see is, what is maybe in every 10 years or five years, uh, a report comes whereby uh, the organization wants to go out and respond to a locust infestation, but it happens yearly now. So locust infestation, drought, and COVID-19. So we need to stand together uh, uh, globally and African nations especially uh, and global thought and try to uh, put together concerted effort and the report is uh, the ICCP report and also uh, uh, Paris agreement are not doing much because uh, the global warming and climate change is caused by highly industrialized countries. What we can do together is Africa and especially developing countries and the entire international community to put the right response together and uh, uh, respond to the climate change effects. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Very good answer. Um, my next question is to Dr. Brosman. Deborah, what's the role of nature-based solutions and um, in mitigation and both ad adapting uh, to climate change uh, and um, the combined benefits? Thank you, Andreas. Well, nature-based solutions are a really important tool in our arsenal against climate change, both in mitigation and adaptation. And what they are, it's basically leveraging the power and the services that ecosystems provide to humans, specifically for use in climate adaptation, climate mitigation. So we know, for instance, as you were talking about the coastal zone, one of the impacts of climate change is that we're seeing sea level rise, an increase in hurricane frequency and intensity, and we're also seeing greater storm surge. Now, coastal dunes are protective barriers along the coastal zone. They mitigate against um, storm surge, they help to keep sand on the beach, and they protect properties. Similarly, we find the same, well, with coastal dunes, we, what, how they provide beach protection, you do not see that with a seawall, for instance. A seawall will accelerate water flow and erode the beach, and ultimately you lose that protection. 
having probably spent a lot of money on building one. Coral reefs are, are similar. A living reef will absorb about 95% of a wave's energy, and that again protects the shoreline. It helps to keep sand on the beach. If a reef dies and collapses and sinks about a meter down, we're going to get about 300 meters more of inundation. So these are the kind of services that ecosystems provide to humans that turns out to be very valuable during, you know, in, in adapting to climate change and mitigating climate change. And there are things that we can do now. I think it's very important too to realize that nature-based solutions are not business as, un as usual for environmentalism. They're interventions. So I'll give you an example. We've been restoring seven miles of dunes. In order to do that, we first did a huge amount of analysis to estimate what would be the future condition of this area in 50 years time with climate change. And we built the dunes for those conditions, including with the vegetation, not the way they were, but how we expect them to function in about 50 years. Now there is an added environmental value. We also brought back sea turtles and had 35 jobs for local people. So these values are also there, but fundamentally it's a mitigation adaptation. Similarly, coral reefs, we now know how to design and build reefs and locate them so that we get the maximum benefit for storm surge protection for the coastal zone. But again, coming with that, we do get an added benefit to fisheries, to local economy. So if we look back and think about where are we today, you know, many of these systems have been degraded. So intervening to restore them, recognizing that we get two values is really important. We're facing now somewhere between 2 billion, I think 200 billion and 1 trillion dollars a year over the next 25 to 30 years related to climate change, the loss of the coastal zone, increased erosion, having to relocate communities. That's the bill we're facing right now if we do nothing. And nature-based solutions are a tool that we can use to help to mitigate that, reduce that cost, and reduce the impact on humans. Thank you, Thank you very much, Deborah. Thank you so much. Uh, my next question is um, to uh, Mr. Leser. Um, New Zealand uh, is very supportive of uh, small island developing states, uh, particularly in the South Pacific. What are your country's priority, uh, priorities towards COP27 uh, with regard to climate justice and the needs of the SIDS? Kia ora koutou katoa and greetings everyone. It is such a pleasure to be here this afternoon and to be a participant representing the Government of New Zealand at the Doha Forum. I'd like to first of all thank the Qatar Government for the invitation as well as for hosting uh, those of us who come from overseas. I'm originally from the Pacific, born and raised in Tonga until I was 16 years of age and now I'm a member of parliament in the government of New Zealand led by the Right Honourable Prime Minister Jacinda Ardern and I bring greetings from her. New Zealand is a country in the Pacific so we say that we are a Pacific country even though we are a developed country and because of the fact that I was born in the Pacific climate change as an issue is an issue that we take to heart quite seriously. New Zealand is quite unique, I suppose, in developed countries because when you look at representation of parliamentarians, we have a total of 120 MPs in our government. 11 of us are from the Pacific. And so when you look at actual connections between our country at all different levels, um, we are represented quite well. New Zealand as a country, um, is really focused on the Pacific. Why? Because we are of the region. And I bring the regional perspective not only from Aotearoa, but also because we are part of the Pacific. And as many of you know, as experts in climate change, it is one of the parts of the world that is most vulnerable to climate change. It is a global crisis, and some Pacific countries, it's currently facing existential threat. These small Pacific developing countries are at some places, the highest point is only a few meters above sea level. 
It is a collective challenge that we face, and it requires a collective solution with participation from all countries and all peoples. And I'd like to give an example of just how climate change affects us. Some of you may remember earlier on this year in January 15th, there was a huge volcanic eruption that happened in Tonga where I was born. It was felt and heard as far away as Alaska, which is thousands and thousands of kilometers away. After the volcanic eruption, there was a huge tsunami. This tsunami washed away hundreds of houses, many schools, and many fishing boats in Tonga. Some of the smaller islands in Tonga have absolutely no houses, no buildings left standing. All have been washed away by the tsunami. It is a miracle that only three lives were lost in these two disasters. However, the hundreds of families and children that have been dislocated as a result of the tsunami is a stark example of what happens in the Pacific when so many of the countries in the Pacific are just a few meters above sea level. And the disaster that awaits due to climate change if we all do not act collectively. New Zealand takes very seriously its responsibilities as a global citizen and as a party to the Paris Agreement. And most of all, as a developed nation and supporting developing countries like the Pacific to reduce the causes of climate change and its impacts. Our view is that New Zealand's prosperity, our security and our well-being is interlinked and that of the Pacific, and it largely depends on international collaborative efforts. Global climate change action involves each and every one of us, and there needs to be a multitude of responses made in that common direction. Around 70% of our overseas investment in terms of development aid is invested in the Pacific, and this is over $2 billion worth um, overall, and we are the second largest um, donor in the Pacific, second only to Australia, our neighbour. On the issue of climate justice, I'd like to reflect on the experience that we have with our Treaty of Waitangi. The Treaty of Waitangi is our founding document in Aotearoa New Zealand. It has taught us many, many lessons about enduring relationships and the importance of dialogue, the importance of bringing along the Pacific countries with us. This is relevant because we recognize that the Pacific has inherent mana and they have sovereign aspiration to achieve sustainable development as well as actions to mitigate and adapt to the impacts of climate change, but only with assistance from developed countries like us. The core drivers of our Pacific engagement are first, our hononga, which is connectivity with the Pacific in terms of our people, economic and our health, and in addition to the number of MPs that we represent, I also want to say that we have just over 400,000 Pacific people in New Zealand, which makes up a huge number of our population of 5 million. Our collective kaitiakitanga, which is our stewardship responsibilities for shared resource, is the second driver. And the third core driver is our national security interests, including our transboundary nature and threats facing the Pacific. In terms of COP27, we appreciate the international fora such as United Nations, which allows us to focus on climate change in a constructive way. We're pleased with the progress of COP26, and we're looking forward to COP27 in Egypt later this year. Thank you. Thank you very much for your, um, for your statement. Thank you so much. Um, Ambassador uh, Akram, uh, what is the G7070 and China's uh, strategy towards COP27 and what are key negotiation objectives? Thank you. Thank you, Andres. And first of all, let me express my gratitude to the government of Qatar for the invitation and to you for inviting me uh, on, this, uh, on this panel. Let me start by setting the stage of where the developing countries look at the present challenges that we face. We are facing a triple crisis in the achievement of the Sustainable Development Goals. We first had the pandemic, 
we now have the Ukraine-related sanctions to deal with, and climate change is the third challenge. That is an existential challenge, and we, we, ex we agree with that position. What developing countries need to deal with the triple challenge is first and foremost financial resources. We have not seen the mobilization of that, those financial resources. Just after the pandemic, the estimate was that the developing countries would need $4.3 trillion to recover just from the pandemic. We have been able to mobilize around 100 billion, if that, in additional finance after the pandemic. Inequity in the vaccine distribution continue with its impacts on developing countries. And therefore, the first question I think that developing countries want to look at is, is there sufficient solidarity in the world to be able to mobilize the actions that are needed on climate change, on the sustainable development goals, and to help them recover from these impacts of these three crises that I have mentioned. Going into COP27, our focus is likely to be first and foremost on adaptation finance. We need to adjust. The developing countries are not responsible for the climate crisis. 200 years of industrial emissions are irresponsible for those crises. So we, we have to adapt to what has happened to us because of no fault of us. And that is the first priority. We need at least 50% of the 100 billion promised in climate finance for adaptation, including for nature-based solutions that, have, that has been mentioned, and which is very important. In, in my country, we, this is the strategy we are, we are following. So that's the, that's the first thing. Secondly, mitigation will have to come mostly from the industrial countries. There is, we cannot be given a choice of either saving the planet or starving our people. The developing countries have to grow and their emissions are going to grow. Even countries, China has a, has a strategy, a transition strategy. India has announced that its peak or its zero emissions will come only in 2070. There are over almost a billion people which, who are in absolute poverty. And they are mostly in Africa and in South Asia. So these are regions which will have to develop and their emissions will grow. There is no doubt about it. And therefore, the industrial countries need to aim not, not for net zero, they need to aim for net negative in order to enable the developing countries the space to grow. As such. So at COP27, these will be our benchmarks. Can the developed countries achieve even the 45% cut that they have promised in Glasgow? We don't see it. They will need to go further than 45% cut in emission. How will they get it? We see the, see the demand for fossil fuels going up, not down. You need a transition strategy. We are not going to get away from fossil fuels. So what is the transition strategy that our industrial country partners are planning at this moment? They need to switch to renewables. Yes, that's a major part of the solution. They need to have gas as a transition strategy, and that's going to be part of the solution. They need carbon capture technologies in order to achieve that. 
and energy efficiency, much greater emphasis on that because that is going to be the transition strategy. We are not going to switch overnight from fossil fuels to renewables. So with the, uh, in the industrial world has to give us a feasible transition strategy to achieve net negative by 20, 2050. We need, from our side, we will emphasize adaptation. We will emphasize loss and damage. We have suffered because of the actions of the industrial countries and those developing countries like the SIDS need to be compensated and to, help, to be helped to achieve uh, the, the transition that is required uh, by the whole planet. Thank you so much, Ambassador. Um, thank you. I would like to build on that um, for in, in going into a second round of questions. And please, uh, dear panelists, be brief in your answers, if possible, because we also would like to include our dear audience here. Achim Steiner, uh, building on this um, loss and damage fund has been called for for many COPs and many years. Um, and even the Copenhagen, actually I remember when uh, President Obama announced um, the adaptation uh, fund. Uh, I was still a UN staff member then, a senior UN staff member. I really remember this Copenhagen uh, fateful conference very well. And so 12 um, years later, we still have only about 50% of these 100 billion met and there is big concern, great concern uh, about this element of climate justice. So how can the UN help and how do you see uh, a potential breakthrough in uh, negotiations, um, consultations in both filling up the adaptation fund and getting uh, a loss and damage fund uh, into action? Well, let us first of all, I think all agree that the fact that we are meeting at COP27 and still have not managed to realize that $100 billion commitment is one reason why the group of 77 in China, and I quote here, Mahmoud Akram now, comes to these negotiations with a deeper degree of skepticism. And I think it is one of the great failures of the last decade that um, we have not seen the wisdom of actually mobilizing those 100 billion. Um, if you just look at, you know, a 12-hour extreme weather event in an economy in the heart of Europe, Germany, last year, just the cost of repairing those damages is estimated around 30 billion euros. The irrationality of not mobilizing $100 billion to essentially leverage and unleash hundreds of billions of dollars in developing country investments is one of the worst policy decisions I think we will look back to in the history books of this particular period. And it is actually tragic because in some ways that lost period of time is not just measured in terms of lost opportunity, lost transitions, accelerated transitions. It's actually bringing us closer to the point of no return. Now, let's see at COP27. Um, unfortunately, with everything that is happening around us, there are some who think that climate change will lose in centrality perhaps or in attention. I would venture to argue yes, that risk is there, but equally the opposite could happen. There is not a single nation on this planet that has anything to gain from further delaying decarbonization and essentially moving us away from that precipice that is in some respects just eight years away, namely the 1.5 degree target. Now, are these numbers absolute? No, you could have miracles happen and then it might be 10 years away. But what we do know is that somewhere in the next decade, we have passed the point of no return on 1.5 degrees. Not even by some extraordinary mythological magic would we be able to recover. And so we are locked in for centuries. And now comes the loss and damage question. And I'll stop very, very briefly because to be very honest, there is no answer to that yet. It is a legitimate and it is also an overdue discussion in the negotiations in the Climate Change Convention. But let me also be very frank, I don't think anyone right now can present a solution that is either politically or economically viable or just fair and equivalent. So I think this is where the UN, where the Climate Change Convention is the forum
where countries are able to um, essentially advance positions, um, find solutions, sometimes intermediate steps. And I think in the meantime, we have every reason to believe in one another's ability to accelerate action by investing in one another. And I think this is, on the one hand, the $100 billion that industrialized countries um, committed, but it's also in the self-interest of every developing nation to look at where it is able to move faster towards um, a decarbonized um, economic development pathway. And just to remind you, um, the transition towards renewable energy is happening extremely quickly. If you take a country like Denmark today, close to 60-70% of its electricity is now produced by renewables. This has happened in less than 20 years. Germany, one of the world's largest exporting economies in the world, um, is now at close to 45, approximately 50% of its electricity being produced by renewables. These are countries that are located not exactly in the optimal solar or renewable energy regions of the world. These transitions have happened in less than two decades. So the future is going to be low carbon. And therefore, economic development strategies, not just because of carbon emissions, but in fact of the new technologies, the new um, energy infrastructure, the new transportation technologies, will rapidly pivot forward. And uh, therefore, also from an economic national point of view, immense urgency in investing in these pathways. And again, loss and damage, the co-financing, the $100 billion, these are ways in which we could accelerate a joint response to a shared challenge. And that, I think, let me end on that, because of where we find ourselves politically in the world today, climate change may be one of the few issues on which everyone will agree losing time will cost everyone far too much. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, Mr. Gulait, so you represent a country that uh, has um, multiple crises to, to tackle and deal with it. Um, and um, it's, it's, it's huge. And so I'm wondering how is it possible uh, to uh, manage, uh, you know, avoiding uh, catastrophic trade-offs by neglecting any of the agendas such as state building, peace building, um, economic development, human development, social development, human rights, and climate change. I mean, it must be a very difficult task, but what is your strategy towards um, keeping those crises uh, somehow on the radar together? Yes, thank you. I, I first of all agree with uh, Ambassador Akram that developed countries uh, should take responsibility, especially in mitigation and support uh, adaptation. Uh, I would like to highlight some points which are evidence-based as far as climate change and climate crisis are concerned, and also impacting uh, developing countries uh, like Somalia. Uh, the report is from COP26, COP confirming how far short the world is from producing these impacts given the ever-rising pollutants in the atmosphere. And uh, last month's IPCC report on climate change impacts, adaptation, and vulnerability equally how highlighted how the catalog of impacts will continue to worsen if there is no improved action. Again, the countries to suffer most are those with the least capacity to adapt, the least capacity to cope. Countries like Somalia that are fragile and in conflict. Uh, and unfortunately, again, such fragile and conflict countries are the least to receive the much needed international support for adaptation and loss and damage. So the global climate crisis needs rethinking in order to save all of us, more so the most vulnerable of the world. Uh, the nationally determined contributions the NDC, and uh, I'm the one who signed it and, and submitted after one year long uh, revision and review, alone may not secure 
the Paris Agreement goal of limiting temperature rise to 1.5 degree centigrade. So for Somalia, climate change action is about peace building, it is about poverty eradication, it is about eradicating hunger, uh, tackling energy poverty, and it's about leaving no one behind. So let us seek uh, to overcome inequalities and injustice through climate change and build together a climate resilient world. Uh, yes, we are doing peace building, which is in relation to governance, uh, constitutional review, and if we are capable of reviewing those again and stand together, we can respond to the climate change crisis. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Goulait. Um, Deborah, um, we have talked about desertification, um, land-based terrestrial ecosystems and um, adaptation and mitigation measures. Uh, let's not forget about the oceans mm -hmm. and the coastal zones. So um, how, what are the key concerns of marine and coastal biodiversity and how are they connected with uh, social justice and human development? Good question. Uh, so basically 66% of the oceans, that's two thirds of the oceans, are currently experiencing the impacts of cumulative climate change. And that's in addition to everything you all know about and have heard about biodiversity loss, overfishing, pollution, um, habitat destruction. So our oceans are in trouble. But let's bring it back to the idea of how do we get social justice and equity as we tackle these issues. So right now, in the last 10 years, less than 1% of the value of the ocean has been put into sustainable projects for the ocean and ocean communities from either philanthropy or overseas development assistance. And that's knowing that our ocean is 75% of the planet. Sustainable Development Goal 14, life beneath the water, receives the lowest amount of funding of any of the sustainable development goals. Now, those communities that are most dependent on the ocean, that are the most vulnerable to climate change and biodiversity loss, are typically those communities that do not have the resources, the funding to do anything about it. So what we need to do, I believe, is develop some new financing mechanisms. Tap into investors, we're seeing uh, like Blue Ocean Fund, the UN Capital Development Fund, that are starting to look at different ways to bring funding into those communities to support the local communities. We need ways to incentivize them, we need ways to tap into young entrepreneurs. You know, all the bright people are not living in Silicon Valley. There's a lot of bright people living in communities around the world that are underserved, that are disenfranchised. That's where we've got to go and give the funding, support them, the solutions will be amazing. That's the first thing. And I think the second is we need to pay attention as we start to implement things like nature-based solutions. If you look around the world at coastal cities or indeed any city, the poorer communities have less access to nature, less green space. If you go to places like co poorer coastal development areas or small island developing states, a lot of the poorer communities are in the coastal zone that's most subject to flooding. So as we start to invest in nature-based solutions and other solutions, we need to pay attention that we don't create another divide between those who can afford the solutions and those who can't. We've got to make sure that the solutions are equitably distributed and that benefit all. Thank you so much, uh, Deborah. thank you. Uh, Mr. Leza, um, what are the key concerns of indigenous peoples and groups uh, in all this and how can their voices be amplified in a global arena much more than they have been even at COP26. Thank you for the question, Dr. Andreas. There are a number of key concerns for indigenous Pacific peoples. However, I'll cover only two because you've told us to um, cut our um, responses down. The key security concern for Pacific countries is the urgent and unprecedented impact of climate change as expressed in the Bowie Declaration, which states, and I quote, climate change remains the single greatest threat to the livelihoods, security, and well-being of the people of the Pacific. We stand together, that's us in New Zealand, with the Pacific in calling for more funding and assistance for green development. And I agree um, with your words that on the international um, level at COP26, um, 
we were successful in bringing us closer to the US 100 billion per annum climate finance goal. However, we're not quite there yet. More specifically, though, in New Zealand, we've stepped up our climate finance commitments. And in the lead up to COP26, our Prime Minister, the Right Honourable Jacinda Ardern, announced New Zealand 1.3 billion in grant-based climate finance to developing countries, especially in the Pacific. Remember, New Zealand is a very small country, so this investment is quite big for us. This is more than four times the size of our previous commitment, which was 300 million. Increasingly, climate change is being mainstreamed into aid development initiatives. So a number of these initiatives are provided across a range of sectors, including energy, infrastructure, tourism, agriculture, coastal protection, and disaster risk reduction. These efforts underline the importance that New Zealand attaches to global and regional efforts to work together to combat climate change. We're looking for ways to stretch and grow this partnership we've established with our Pacific neighbourhoods, where we've found innovative ways to support local responses to challenges, such as Tonga's efforts to future-proof its water supply and sanitation infrastructure. Aotearoa stands with the Pacific and we will continue to amplify the Pacific voice in calling for urgent global action in forums like this and in other international conferences. Our efforts have to combine development and economic focus. In New Zealand's work with other countries, we focus on co-investments that support long-term resilience in line with Pacific priorities with a high degree of Pacific ownership. In terms of COVID-19, the pandemic has been really, really devastating for the Pacific. Many of these small island developing countries were COVID free up until a few weeks ago for some of them. All Pacific countries are experiencing severe economic shocks due to COVID-19. Samoa is currently under lockdown because of COVID-19. Fiji was under lockdown for many weeks about a year ago and Tonga, right after the volcanic eruption and the tsunami just a few days later, COVID-19 for the first time was found in the community. So they're dealing with three different crises all at the same time. They ran out of rat tests. They do not have enough PPE. There are many other issues facing this small nation. So climate change is very real, but they're also facing many other issues right now, including food security. Because when the volcano um, erupted, it blanketed the whole country with um, volcanic ash, basically killed all of the crops and the food um, in the country. So as we look at addressing immediate challenges, we should focus also on supporting some of the sectors that have been damaged. The supply chain um, disruptions is also having a big impact and the economic turmoil because of COVID-19. Marlo. Thank you so very much, thank you. Uh, Ambassador Akram, final question. And that's a big question, I admit. What's your vision for climate justice? And how can a more just approach to climate governance be achieved? Thank you. Thank you, Andrew. Um Let me just first try to identify something which Akim tried to tease out as to what is going to be a possible consensus whether climate can be the one area around which the global community can come together. I would broaden that. I would say the global community can come together around the sustainable development goals because I think the issue is broader than just climate change. And if we are able to achieve a consensus around implementing genuinely and sincerely the Sustainable Development Goals, I believe that that is one area that we should promote at the United Nations and in the, in the international community. Secondly, on climate justice, let me, let me just say, first of all, we are very skeptical, and I say many developing countries, about the implementation of the mitigation goals announced by the the industrial countries. We don't see the pathway. The transition plans are not there. The United States, we should take, it's not there. President Biden failed in his efforts to get 
a real transition plan. So we need to see real transition mitigation plans by the industrial countries. We need to see the, the $100 billion plus commitment to climate finance. Today, coalitions have been formed because of the G7 decisions, coalitions to help developing countries get off coal, only coal, so that they can contribute to mitigation. Where is the money for adaptation? Where is the money for loss and damage? So this is the essence. A country like Pakistan, we have not burnt our coal. We have not exploited our coal. We have not been approached to have a climate coalition. But when we start burning our coal, that's when we'll be approached of how to stop using our coal. So this is an example of climate injustice that needs to be rectified. If there is going to be help to developing countries, don't punish those who haven't sinned, at least. Thirdly, and lastly, money mobilized for climate finance and for transition plans. The plans are there, the NDCs are there. They have to be translated into viable pipeline of projects to be implemented, both on mitigation, adaptation, etc. Even if we mobilize that money, S Senator Kerry spoke about translating billions into trillions. How do we do that? when most developing countries do not have the capacity to formulate viable, bankable projects. And that is where the UN should come in, and that is something, a conversation we've, I've had with Akin repeatedly. The UN has 123 or four country offices around the world, help the developing countries formulate viable, projects. Otherwise, the money to developing countries will only go to 20 or 30 who are capable of doing it. The smaller countries, the SIDS, the African countries, don't have the capacity. We must be helped. And the UN is the place who should take the lead in helping us develop the projects to which blended finance can be attractive. Thank you. Therefore, the UN has to be empowered uh, and supported by OECD member countries and other member countries. It's, um, it's a very uh, um, tricky situation. Do we have time for two questions from the audience? Thank you so much. Yes, ma'am. Do you have, yeah, microphone. Thank you to all our panelists for the very thought-provoking session today. Um, my question is that there are millions who are being displaced on annual uh, basis, as I mentioned in the beginning of, of the session today. Uh, while the term climate refugees have been coined and is being thrown around, as you may know that um, um, the, the 1951 Refugee Convention does not provide grounds for those who are being um, um, displaced by climate change to be recognized as refugees uh, because it demands um, a well-founded fear of persecution. Um, there is a, uh, there's a benefit of being recognized as a refugee because it grants that those displaced with the right of um, protection from arbitrary deportation, which then climate refugees do not have. In that light, my question is, um, how do we bridge the gap between the international framework or international legal framework of climate change and forced displacement? I hope my question makes sense. It does uh, very much so. Thank you so much. And who are you directing the question to? To any of the panelists who's uh, willing to take it. Okay, thank you. Uh, there was another question. Yes, sir. Thank you very much. I, I think my question would go to Mr. Akin. Uh, it's about speaking from a, an NGO perspective, about the NGOs working on, on climate on different perspectives, like from my point of view, climate heritage. Would there be any new windows by the UN of financing uh, 
climate heritage uh, initiatives, you know, as we are in the middle of the whole world is going towards fighting climate change and, and all of that. Would that be, uh, what are the plans maybe for financing uh, NGOs who work in climate heritage or climate in, in general with the UN? Thank you very much. Thank you. Let's go with the first question first. Um, who would like to answer the question about migration? Ambassador? Uh, well, you know, the, my, the 1951 Refugee Convention was drafted in the aftermath of the Second World War. The considerations were persecution, and therefore I think economic migration, I mean, the climate migration is a form of economic migration, and that is not recognized in the Convention. But you're right, international law has to evolve. Uh, migration today is taking place because of conflict, but also because of climate change. Uh, and, and normal economic migration as well. Uh, I think the whole, whole migration debate has to be, has to be reviewed. Uh, the basis for accepting uh, people as refugees or as asylum seekers or as economic migrants, all of this needs to be looked at holistically. We, we have compartmentalized our humanity. And I think we need to have a, a holistic and comprehensive approach to the fact that people do move. Uh, and they have throughout history. And it's a good thing when people move because they can contribute to economic development in, in host countries uh, as such. So this is a bigger debate and it needs to be had uh, within the context of the United Nations and to accommodate all forms of migratory flows in the future. Thank you. To the second question, uh, Rinsteiner. Let me just add one more word. I think um, to, to this question of refugees or climate refugees, internally displaced people, I think one of the reasons why we are struggling with that precisely that evolution of the instrument is that the nature and scale of what we are actually speaking about is in some ways difficult to fathom and to accept. And I think one of the reasons why even going back to the Geneva Accords in 1951 convention is that people are concerned that the definition and the protection accorded under those legal instruments would be difficult to replicate in today's world. I mean, in a sense, we are in a regressive um, period when it comes to affording protection. And I think my partial answer to that is that we have to intervene faster in order to avoid those numbers of displaced and, and ultimately people forced to, to flee their home because they cannot survive there anymore because we cannot cope with the kind of numbers we are talking about, which is a very grim prospect um, when you think that these numbers are not in the next century, they're in the next decades. To the question, I just have to ask briefly, climate heritage, can you um, enlighten me a little bit what, what specifically you refer to that, then I can Where, answer hopefully. Yeah, sure. Uh, this refers to the projects that handle or deal with the impacts of climate change on heritage sites. Ah, understood, okay, okay thank you. Um, well, first of all, I mean, the, the, the whole climate finance architecture that we have established in recent years, I think, is in urgent need of overhaul. Um, the Global Environment Facility, the Green Climate Fund, these are instruments that are, um, in a sense, late responses to a need that has by far exceeded also the design objectives of these instruments. So we do need to think carefully about what are the vehicles for actually um, making the kind of investment support, co-investments, financing, um, and, and ODA budgets perhaps that need to be rethought, um, catch up with where reality is, because the timeline of how we need to decarbonize as a planet, irrespective now of individual countries, their capabilities and responsibilities, 
is totally out of sync with where we are actually mobilizing financing. And I commend New Zealand because, indeed, the increase that your government committed to is of a nature and scale that is needed. But we are, as we have spoken repeatedly, um, far from that. Secondly, can investments with NGOs be undertaken? Well, they can already today. I mean, in some of these instruments, we do see non-governmental organizations, particularly also in the conservation nature-based solutions domain, um, becoming more prominent players. But I think we also need to find, um, you know, a far more broad-based approach at national level, community-level investments. World Heritage Sites are usually, or heritage sites, usually very location-specific. Can one, in a sense, finance actors within the, the context of such a heritage site directly? And I think it is particularly through UNESCO that we um, need to look perhaps more specifically, because they are the custodians of the World Heritage Convention, whether that kind of financing linked to climate change and heritage is in need of greater attention. I will certainly take that suggestion with me and, and share it with my colleague also. Thank you. Thank you so very much. Uh, we are well over time, and I want to apologize, but I, I hope you agree that this has been a fantastic session. Thank you to the audience, everybody in the room. Thank you so much, dear panelists. It was wonderful. And with that, uh, I hand over to the organizers and wish you a pleasant rest of the day.